Good morning, everyone. Let's begin with a chant. Uh, if you know the chant, just um, chant along with me. Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamaya Avir Avir Maedhi Rutra Yatte Dakshinam Mukham Tena Mam Pahinityam Tena mam pahinityam Om Shanti 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 Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to mortality. O Lord, shine through and through and ever protect us with thy loving presence. Om Peace, Peace. Well, <clears throat> today we have a fun topic we're going to be discussing. Um, we're going to be talking about the images of an avatar. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the images of Sri Ramakrishna. You know, prior to the photographs of Sri Ramakrishna, you know, as, as I know, as far as I know, in the history, we have not had a photo, it's the first time we've had a photograph of a living avatar. Normally what you've seen when we look at pictures of gods and goddesses and statues is you're seeing the, the revelation that some sages, some people have experienced within themselves. And then they're taking that revelation, that image that they've seen, and then depicting it on a canvas or creating on some type of murti, on some type of form. But Today, for the first time in history, we actually have in photograph, we've captured the image of a living avatar. That's amazing. And today we're going to go into sort of like a detail about what those images mean. Before I go on, how many of you, um, how many pictures of Sri Ramakrishna were taken? Anybody? Three? So there's three that we normally have seen. Anybody else? Okay, so, huh? Four. Okay, good. All right, getting closer. There are actually six that were taken, photographs that were taken, five that exist, and out of those five, three that we commonly see. And out of those three, one that's mostly seen. Okay. Um, Today, then, what we're going to do, the best way to go through these photographs is we're going to speak a little bit about the history. What you see in this photograph is not just a snapshot. There is a, circum, uh, there is a, a, a certain set of events and circumstances that led to that shot. Um, secondly, we're going to see what they symbolize. When you're seeing the photograph of an avatar, everything in that picture has meaning. So we're going to try to break down what are some of the symbolic things that, what do they signify? What do they represent? And third, we're going to see if that we can find some type of connection to that photograph. It's important because in spiritual practice, um, how can we use these photographs to deepen our spiritual lives? As you start to look at that image of the avatar, what is it conveying to you? Wow, how do we connect with them? In the process of visualization, some of you, if you meditate, you visualize, there are three things that really are helpful uh, visualization. One is to get a little bit about, of knowledge about the image that you're trying to visualize. Second is to gain some type of familiarity with it. And third is to gain an emotional connection with it. These will help sustain your visualization. And when we see Sri Ramakrishna, specifically these three photographs of Sri Ramakrishna, what do we start to see? Well, one Swami had told me, 
These are three states of Turiya. Normally, we experience a waking state. When we go to sleep, we dream. There's a dreaming state. And sometimes we have dreamless sleep, deep sleep. But there's another dimension within us, the dimension of Turiya. And that is what you're seeing Sri Ramakrishna ex expressing in these three photographs. It's his connection with ultimate reality. And that those three photographs are expressing three different moods with ultimate reality. Vajrapran has given me a time. I have to be finished by 11 o'clock. This is an hour and a half lecture, or 12 o'clock. So I'm going to have to condense it. And I'm going to go through things really quick. But uh, I'll be here for questions afterwards, if you, if you have any questions. Um, uh, so, and what I'm going to state is that these three photographs, you'll see Sri Ramakrishna is identified in three different states. The state of pure awareness as Brahman. Another state is identified with the pure cosmic being, Ishvara. And another state, you'll see him identified in the avatar state. When you see the photograph of Sri Ramakrishna, do you get a sense of awe? Is there a sense of mystery? Is there a sense of wonder that's created? Does it create, a, do you feel a sense of transcendence? What do you feel when you start to begin to see these photographs? What do they appear to be telling you about yourself? Today, let's try to unlock a little bit of the mystery behind these photos. Holy Mother had said, the body and the shadow are the same. And what is his picture but a shadow? If you pray to him constantly before his picture, then he manifests himself through the picture. This is a really powerful statement. I was thinking about this for like one week in order to have a shadow, what must be present? A person. A person must be there. Unless you're a vampire, there's got to be a shadow. <laughs> what Holy Mother is saying is that hidden within the shadow, hidden within the photo, there exists a divine being. Call out to him, and he emerges from the shadow, from the photo, to make himself known. If I had more time, I'll just throw this out at you. We can explain later. In order to create a shadow, there are three things necessary. You have to have a source of light, something that's illumining. You have to have an object, and that object will cast a shadow. The light, in this sense, what Mother is saying, is the light of consciousness. The object is Sri Ramakrishna. Consciousness taking the form, crystallizing to the shape, the being of Sri Ramakrishna. And the shadow is the photograph. Call, call to the photograph with sincerity, with faith and devotion. The being behind the photograph, the conscious being, comes out. And she would actually see this. She would say, when she, when she was feeding the photograph, the image of Ramakrishna, she would say, I would see a ray of light coming from the master's eyes, touching all the food items that were offered to him. <laughs> what you're going to start to see is that the photograph of Ramakrishna, the image of Ramakrishna, is not only linked to a memory. Normally when we look at a photograph, we associate that photograph with a past memory, good or bad. That photograph takes is intrinsically linked to the divine itself. Just like the mantra is intrinsically linked to the divine itself. In another conversation between M and Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna here gives us a clue to who he is. Rajaprana, you're taking M. You explained clearly the other day how God incarnates himself on earth. Tell me what I said. You told us to imagine a field extending to the horizon and beyond. It extends without any obstruction, but we cannot see it on account of a wall in front of us. In that wall, there is a round hole. Through that hole, we see a part of that infinite field. Tell me what that hole is. 
You are that whole. Through you can be seen everything, that infinite meadow without any end. Sri Ramakrishna was very much pleased. Patting M's back, he said, I see you have understood. That's fine. What is Sri Ramakrishna saying here? What is he trying to imply here? To me, there's a wall. There's a wall of limitation, a wall of maya that we all experience. And through this hole, in this wall, we, ne- we can experience our infinite field. What is our infinite field? Our vast, infinite nature. So could it be, by going through this hole, what do we start to remove? We start to remove the limitations we experience with this body. We start to remove the prison that we experience with our mind. The identification we have with our ego. And going through that hole, we experience our unlimited, infinite self. Is this what Sri Ramakrishna is saying? That's why when you hear statements like Christ saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And when Krishna says, abandoning dependence on all your duties, take refuge in me alone, I shall liberate you from all your sins. Grieve not. From a Vedantic perspective, avatars are the whole. Go through them and experience your infinite nature. So when you look at these photos, these photos to me appear to be what we call divine dirtas, sacred passages to the divine. Is Sri Ramakrishna a dirta? A dirta basically is a crossing place in the sense of a transition or junction. In this sense, it's used to indicate a place or presence where the sacred is easily reachable. In the Upanishads, the crossing over refers to the spiritual transition and transformation from this world to the world of Brahman, the Supreme, the world illumined by the light of knowledge. Is it basically saying then these photographs are sacred passages where you can go from one side into the divine? But not only that, they seem to be two-way passages where the divine can come to you. So why do we meditate on an an avatar? Because they are the bridge between the tirta, between the human and the divine. They link the nitya, the eternal, with the lila, the play of the divine. So today, let's go a little bit further and try to uncover the mystery behind these photos photos of the avatar. Now, to do this, we are going to talk again a little bit about the history, the meaning and symbolism, listen to what the authoritative sources have said, and then try to understand what is this image trying to convey? What mood does it start to elicit within you? The first photograph of Ramakrishna um, was taken at Keshav Sen's house. Sunday, September 21st, 1879. Keshav Sen, a noted reformer and leader of the Brahma Samaj movement, invited Sri Ramakrishna to a Brahma festival at his house. The well-known singer, Trilokya Natsanyal, was present. Swami Raghavananda, a disciple of Swami Brahmananda, said this about this photo. The devotional music threw Sri Ramakrishna into ecstasy. He uttered the word Om and stood up, raising his right hand. His outer senses left him, and he went into samadhi. Fearing that the unconscious body would fall to the ground, Sri Ramakrishna's nephew and attendant, Hridoy, supported Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna probably had been wearing his chatter either over his shoulder or hanging folded from his left shoulder, as is the custom. But when Sri Ramakrishna rose, the chatter fell to the ground. Hridoy picked it up and tied it around his waist for safekeeping. At this point, Keshav had taken the photo. Okay, take a good long stare at this photograph here. What do you see? You see Sri Ramakrishna standing up in the midst of Keshav's followers who are engaged in devotional singing. Both his hands are raised up and his face has a unique expression. 
there is a screen behind him and at least one window open on this side over here. What's the meaning? Well, during Sri Ramakrishna's time, one Swami told me that the ambient religion in Bengal was the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Just like Protestant Christianity is the ambient religion in America. The religion where Sri Chaitanya's love for Krishna was the predominant religion in Bengal. So probably, Sri Ramakrishna was overwhelmed by the music, began to stand up, and dance in the traditional Vaishnava way when he went into Samadhi. Four copies of this print were made, and one of them had hung in Keshav Sen's house, the house where Ramakrishna's at. From the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, Rajendra says to Keshab, many people say that he, pointing to this picture, is an incarnation of Chaitanya. Keshab, looking at the photograph picture. One does not see such samadhi. Only men like Christ, Muhammad, and Chaitanya experienced it. So, when you start to look at the gestures, the expressions, hand, his eyes, his face, what do you start to see? Well, these are what we call mudras. What are the meaning of these mudras? Mudras are basically physical expressions of your inner state. If I was angry at Vrajaprana, I'd be like waving my hand at her and my face would be clutched. I hate you! This is a mudra. When you get your hand as a child, your hand was caught in the cookie jar and your parents found out and you're like, I give up. It's a mudra. So, in Ramakrishna's case, these are spontaneous outflows of his deep inner awareness expressed through his fingers, his hands, his face and body. Now, these mudras can be interpreted in many number of ways. And to do this uh, project, this talk, I had actually talked to 10 different swamis and a number of devotees. And so today's talk is not something that you're going to find uh, that anybody else, others have done. In fact, there's only three papers that refer to the photographs of Sri Ramakrishna, and they usually, they're talking more about the historical sense. Swami Premananda, so let's take a closer look uh, at his hands that are in certain positions. Swami Premananda, a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, said that everything is there, referring to his right hand, not here in the world, referring to the left. Swami Shraddhananda wrote an article on this particular photograph called Cosmic Meditations on Sri Ramakrishna. In that article, he states his right hand is fully stretched upward with the two fingers, those two fingers here, as if pointing upwards towards the timeless reality which the words of Vedas and Vedantas fail to express. They become silent. He implies here, there's an, uh, there's an implication here in Indian logic called Arundhati Darshanyaya, where you're going from what is known, his fingers, pointing to something which is unknown. Usually when you're trying to find a faint star, you use the brighter star. So here, he's trying to go from the known to the unknown. Now, Swami Shodhananda then goes on to say that the left hand, this, in this mudra, is expressing the Vairagya mudra. The Vairagya means a sense of detachment. And what he's implying here then is that the world that we experience is not real. It's not what it appears to be. It's empty. And this alone is real. God alone is real. Now, when you take a more technical look at the different mudras, what do you find? Well, you find that the right hand is actually called the Mriga Mudra. If you want to make this with your right hand, you can just see what we're doing here. The right hand is the Mriga Mudra. It's the deer mudra. Why do we call it the deer mudra? Because it looks like the face of a deer. What happens when an intruder comes in the awareness of a deer? What happens? Headlights. The, the ears go up, right? The, what does this mean? I am aware. 
I am conscious. With full awareness, I see you. With full presence, I see you. And the left hand is referred to as the Alapadra Mudra, a fully bloomed lotus. Here, in this sense, Sri Ramakrishna had a mystical vision and had this to say. I saw a boy, 22 years old, exactly resembling me, enter the Shishumna nerve and continue and commune with all the lotuses, touching them with his tongue. The different lotuses of those centers, the four-petaled, six-petaled, ten-petaled, and so forth, had been drooping. At his touch, they stood erect. At last, the thousand-petaled lotus in the heart blossomed. Since then, I have been in this state. Here can it be implied then that when all the lotuses bloom within you, when all the chakras open up, you become aware, you become aware that you are pure consciousness, you are pure awareness. Is this what Sri Ramakrishna is trying to say? Now, Swami Atmarupananda had another interesting observation about this photograph. He's uh, the Swami in uh, Houston. And he had stated that this photograph actually uh, represents the Kumra Mudra. The Kumra Mudra is like this. You can see it. And what it represents is a turtoise. Why do we do this mudra? Well, you'll notice sometimes in puja, what happens is we, we're meditating on the divine. And we hold, we hold this mudra because what a turtoise does is it retracts its limb. By actually making this mudra, you'll start to experience all your senses withdrawing into itself. And then it's much easier to focus on the divine. You're withdrawing all your awareness outside and directing it to this, what you're meditating on. But what Swami is saying here is that the left hand is the bottom portion of the mudra and the right hand is the top portion of the mudra. Why is he saying this? Is because the divine is so vast, so expansive, it can't be held onto. So the top blows off. <laughs> and this mudra, and it's just ungraspable. The divine is ungraspable. It's unholdable. Mm -hmm. This is this what Sri Ramakrishna is saying with this mudra. And Swami Chaitananji, a, a sort of a historian Swami of ours, had said that in the early 1900s, a South Indian dancer had saw this photograph of Sri Ramakrishna and didn't know who he was, but stated in the, um, in the uh, Natya Shastras, Indian classical dance, that this expresses the infinite. This expresses the infinite. And Swami Vigyananji said, looking at the face, another direct disciple, Sri Ramakrishna, said the Ramakrishna's face is anande futifata. Anande futifata means it's a certain kind of melon, like a promegranate. It becomes so ripe, what happens? It's about to explode. There's so much joy in Sri Ramakrishna that his ex face is exploding with joy. So, could the implication here be that Sri Ramakrishna was listening to these songs, these devotional songs, he felt a surge divinity rise within him, all the chakras opening up. He got up on his feet like a rocket ship. <laughs> he started moving to the rhythm of the divine cosmic tune and then exploded into stillness. And what do we notice? We notice that there's a screen behind him. Could this screen, everything has an implication in the photograph of an avatar. Could the screen be the Maya? Could the whole, could the window be the hole through Maya? What do you notice about the people here? What are they looking at? Just him. Huh? Just him. Okay, so some people are looking at him. What do you notice about these people? They're looking in this direction, in the direction of the camera. At that time, they had these big field cameras, and it was sort of the latest in technology. And so the people here, it seems like their attention is drawn to the latest things of technology. If you were sitting there, where would your attention be? Would it be out towards the world 
or would it be towards the divine, in awe of the divine? And another thing, these big field cameras, they required about two seconds of exposure. So if there had been any movement in Ramakrishna, he would have been blurred. Now, when you see this photograph, what do you start to feel within you? What starts to arise within you? Do you start to experience a non-dual mood? Do you start to feel a sense of infiniteness, limitlessness, freedom, a sense of stillness? Here, freedom doesn't mean just freedom to choose things. It means being free from being affected of things. You start to see, is there, do you start to experience this perfect tranquility? If he was like a magnet, what is being drawn out of you? Do you start to experience the, a feeling that you want to rise above all the turmoils in life? When you see his eyes and how they're closed, does it give you a sense he seems so indrawn, he's not a caring about the world at all? Does it give you a sense of detachment, indrawnness, a sense of peace, a sense of joy? Does it depict to you that I am pure consciousness, not concerned with the play of nature. I am the formless I, the ground of being, non-locational, eternal, not subject to birth and death. All perceptions, all feelings, all sensations, all thoughts rise, float, and subside. But I am not affected. I am in joy. Is this what's drawing, being drawn out of you through this photograph? To me, this photograph represents the transcendental state of Brahman. If we go to photograph number two, this is a portrait studio. Uh, uh, it was taken in a portrait studio of uh, Ramakrishna on December 10th, 1881 at 3 p.m. at Bo Bazar, Calcutta in the Bengal Photography Studio. It was actually the same photographers that took, that was at Keshav's house. He went to their studio. Ramakrishna went to their studio. Um, from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, it says this, Surinder Mitra took Sri Ramakrishna in a carriage to the studio of the Bengal photographer. The art of photography was explained to him, and he was shown how glass covered with silver nitrate takes the image. As Sri Ramakrishna went into Samadhi, he was photographed. Now, Sri Ramakrishna did not like to have his photograph taken. And the only way to take his photograph would be if he wasn't aware of it. Why? I think because being conscious of your photograph would mean that human elements would show through. But when he was in Samadhi, the body in a sense, becomes transparent, and only divine elements show through. Well, then you may ask, well, why did Sri Ramakrishna go to the photography studio if he didn't want to have his photograph taken? According to Swami Vidyatmanji's article on Ramakrishna's photos, he said Ramakrishna had a lively interest in the things of the day. He would go to the zoo, the circus, the theater, the museum, and many other things. The Gospel says that he inquired about the process of photography, and when the spiritual implications elevated Ramakrishna's mind, he went into Samadhi and the photographer took the photograph. What were those spiritual implications that elevated Ramakrishna's mind? Well, he refers to this experience as, Today I enjoyed very much the machine by which a man's picture is taken. One thing I noticed was the impression does not stay on a bare piece of glass but it remains when the glass is stained with a black solution. In the same way, mere hearing of spiritual talk does not leave any impression. People forget about it soon afterwards. But they, re they can retain spiritual instruction if they are stained inside with earnestness and devotion. Is he saying here the way to retain the information is you have to be truly seeking Swami Chaitanya said, you have to have the emulsion of devotion covered in you. 
for things to stick. Either you have to be in love or you truly have to be a seeker. Now, when it came to finding the meaning of this photograph, um, I couldn't find any meanings that were uh, described about this photograph. But this studio photograph was used and inserted into an oil painting illustrating the harmony of religions. And in this photograph, you see Sri Ramakrishna right here talking to Keshav Shen about the harmony of the different traditions. You'll see there's a Christian church, a, a, um, a Shiva, um, no, I'm sorry, a Muslim mosque and a Shiva temple. And you'll see different, uh, uh, from Chaitan, from different types of people, from different traditions, the Vaishnava tradition, the uh, Shaivai tradition, um, the Jain tradition, Christian. You'll see that Christ and Chaitanya are both dancing together while kirtans are being played. Ramakrishna, referring to this photograph, says, yes, it contains everything. This is the ideal of modern times. He was saying this back in the 1870s, 1880s. It's amazing. I, this could be, as far as I know, I don't know, but one of the earliest uh, paintings depicting harmony of different religions. Now, when you observe the photograph, what do you see? Well, Ramakrishna is wearing a jacket. His right arm <coughs> is on the studio prompt, and his, arm, his hand is facing downward. His left hand is pointing to the right, and his eyes are open compared to the photo number one, where his eyes were closed. Swami Nirvanananda actually took this jacket. This is a different jacket. This was the jacket Ramakrishna wore during Kalpatura Day. He took the jacket, measured it, and then based on ratios, he calculated that Ramakrishna's height was five feet, nine inches, and a quarter. Now, what do the hands signify, the mudras? Well, when you notice the right hand, it's different from the first picture in two ways. In the first photo, his hand was upward towards the transcendence. Whereas you see here, his hand is pointing downwards. Where do you think it's pointing down to? Huh? Us, someone said? To the world. And also, another thing about this right hand is that the thumb is spread out. In photo number one, the thumb was in. This, the thumb spread out, if you look it up in sign language, um, it indicates love. Love that is pointing down to the world. The left hand is, is, uh, pictured, is pictured like this. Okay. And... Uh, it is the reverse of a Gunta Mudra. What normally you'll see like when we do puja is there's, this is called the Avagunta Mudra. And we use it sort of when we're offering food, we'll put a protective covering. It means to veil, to cover. We put a protective shield demarking that this food is for the Lord and we're protecting it. Here his hand is in the opposite position, the reverse position. Here it's signifying unveiling, uncovering, uncovering the universe and revealing his, his radiating bliss through that smile. His eyes are open, signifying that he sees everything, he knows everything. So, when you look at the whole photograph here, to me it's indicative of the imminent aspect of God, the personal aspect of God, which we call Ishvara the cosmic being, the presence of a living consciousness which pervades the entire universe. And it is the right hand, right hand, it is out of love, the overflowing love that the divine has created this universe. Eko aham bahusyasyam. I am one, let me be many. Swami Chidnanji refers to those two fingers pointing down as the fingers of duality. The fingers which create the world, the manifested world, and the three, and the three other fingers are the unmanifested Brahman. Three quarters of our experience is in Brahman, one quarter in the world. The world of duality. What does duality mean? Duality means the pairs of opposites. In every experience of life, 
there's going to be the pairs of opposites inherent in them. Um, for those that watched the Super Bowl, last year's Super Bowl, um, when Tom Brady threw that final pass, it was, the, it was the, the long bomb, hoping for a miracle. And when the ball was dropped, he was play, they were playing New England, no, they were playing uh, Philadelphia. Guess what happened? The time the ball was dropped, Philadelphia had won. We see on one side, Philadelphia fans up in joy. Just, and what happened to New England fans? The feeling of suffering, the feeling of pain. <laughs> Every experience has an, this inherent duality within it. Another photo here is um, sometimes when visiting swamis come and visit Los Angeles, Hollywood, uh, we are asked where to take them. And we take them to the happiest place on earth, okay? <laughs> Disneyland. And here there's actually two swamis. You'll see Swami Atmagananji and Krishnamurti Maharaj. And this is myself behind them. And we're on this right. And what do you experience? What do you see here is that Swami Atmagyanji, if you closely see, if you notice that his face is actually sort of cringed. <laughs> notice the whiteness of his knuckles. How <laughs> Although he's wearing a shirt, t shirt says life is good, he ain't feeling so good. Yeah. <laughs> then if you look at uh, Swami and myself, we seem to be really enjoying the ride. Uh, to me, this resembles the the three gunas, the three gunas. <laughs> Why? Here we have Thomas. Here we have uh, Rajas. We are very much involved in the world. And look at behind me. If you can closely see, there's a person whose face is like this. <laughs> Pure tranquility. It's like stop <laughs> And what's really strange, if you came up and saw the photograph, you'd see a woman here. Her hair is disheveled and her tongue is sticking out like this. <laughs> Mother Kali. The three gunas, she and Mother Kali. This is the world. And if you're like Swami Atmagiri, you can't wait to get out. <laughs> so, remember we see that Ramakrishna in this photo is interested in all things, in museums, photography studio, everything that has flowed out of his creation, his eyes are open to. He sees, he's omniscient. And as Ishvara, as the personal God, he sees and functions through all his creation. He's experienced through humans, ants, plants, animals. All of this is his divine play. So, it's out of the divine love that the universe comes into existence. That's projected from his being. Then it's out of divine grace that we get to go back home to our divine abode. And that is what that left hand symbolizes. His divine grace. The impulse within us to return home. For him to uncover the magic this magical show of Maya, for him to unveil the reality and allow us to know who we really are. So, when you see this photograph, what mood is conveyed within you? Does it elicit the devotional mood within you? Or when you see this, are you seeking someone you can have a relationship with? someone that you can pray to, worship, someone who will guide you? Are you seeking the divine author of this universe, the cosmic being who does what? Who responds to you. A consciousness who, resp who is responsive. Who art thou? Who art thou? Does this photograph create a feeling of surrender within you? Surrendering to that pull that's bringing you closer to him, the divine. So that whatever, whatever you give, I will be satisfied with. Whatever you bring to me, I accept because I know you have brought it to me. I know that you are love. God is love. So everything that happens, even if they're painful things, they're filled with the love of God for my own spiritual upliftment. 
and I, can, and I may see them at the present moment in a painful way, in a limited context, but in a larger context, I see it was all an unfoldment of your grace. This is very difficult. I was listening to some of the stories that the nuns were telling me about what happened in Santa Barbara some, a little while ago. And um, the experiences that people had to suffer through, the tragedies that they uh, had gone through, it's, it's very heart-wrenching. And it's really difficult to understand then what is God's will. Here, does this photograph create a sense of dependency for you? Do you find yourself that maybe thinking that everything is happening by God's will? Oh, mother, I have to act, but please see to it that what I do is in accordance with your will. I have limited knowledge of what I'm going to do in this situation. I cannot see the ends of my action, but you, O oh Lord, you who sees everything, you who knows everything, please see to it that what I do is for the welfare of myself and the welfare of others. So if the first photograph represents the transcendental aspect of the divine, the second photograph represents the imminent aspect of the divine, the personal aspect of God. Ishwara. In photo number three is the meditation pose. And this picture was taken in front of the Radhakantha temple at Dakshin Ishwar in 1884, when Sri Ramakrishna was 48 years old. It occurred on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. According to Swami Nirvanananda, Prashma. Bhavanath Chatterjee, the master's devotee from Baranagor, wanted to take a photograph of the master. One day he requested him very strongly to give his consent, and on the afternoon of the next day brought a photographer along with him from Baranagor. He could not make the master agree. The master just went away near the Radhakanta temple. In the meantime, Narendra arrived on the scene and heard everything. He said, wait a bit, I shall put everything straight. Saying this, he went to the veranda to the west of the Radhakanta temple where Sri Ramakrishna was sitting and started a religious conversation with him. The master went into Samadhi. Swamiji went and called the others and ordered them to get ready quickly to take the picture. In the state of Samadhi, the master's body was bent on one side and therefore the cameraman went to make him sit erect by softly adjusting his chin. But as soon as he touched his chin, the whole body of the master came up like a piece of paper. So light it was. Swamiji then told him, oh, what are you doing? Be quick. Get the camera ready. The cameraman took the exposure as hurriedly as possible. The master was completely unaware of the incident. After some days, when Pavanat brought the printed copy of the photo, the master remarked, this represents a high yogic state. This form will be worshipped in every home as time goes on. So what do we observe here? We observe that Sri Ramakrishna is sitting, his hands tight, lightly clasped with each other, thumbs touching each other, um, his fingers interlocked, his eyes are half open, half closed, his lips appear half open, and he's wearing a dhoti. Um, this, this is a dhoti. And instead of folding it in, it's going up to his top. It's a one piece. There are some distinguishing marks that designate the signs of an avatar. Uh, some of you have heard about this. The first one is Ajanu Bahu. His arms, if you notice his arms, they're very long. Swami Brahmananda would say his arms extend down to his knees. Another feature is that his eye line is way above his ears. If you look at my eyes, they're in accordance to ear level. But his eyes, his ears are way below his eye line. His eyes also have the shape of a lotus. Another trait is Snigna Varna. He had a shining complexion. Holy Mother had said his complexion was like the color of gold. And he had another thing, Sama Bhaktanga. He had symmetrical limbs. These are some of the attributes that they put to, a, to an avatar. 
And then I would ask, I, I asked this one, where's the source for this information? Well, the source is actually in the Valmiki Ramayana. Um, there is a, uh, an incident where Hanuman had come as, fr uh, as, uh, as a representation from Ram and trying to convince Sita that he knew Ram. And so in the dialogue, he's trying to prove he knows Ram by describing Ram. And so in that conversation, some of the features of an avatar is what are listed. When you notice the photograph, do you notice that behind the photograph there's an arch there? Okay. You ever notice how that was done? Why that's there? Well, Avinas Chandra had used one of these box, he was a photographer. And so when he took the photograph, it was those big glass slides, when he took that out and was putting it into its sleeve, he was still a little dazzled by what Vrajaprana had read when Ramakrishna, they, had, uh, they were raising him up and his whole body lifted up in the air. So it, this is what the story goes, that he was still dazzled and he actually, he, the photograph fell down, the glass plate fell down and cracked. And so instead of trying to retake the photo, because that would be almost impossible, he cut it into an archway. Why an archway? At that time, there was a sign of Victor it was a Victorian sign, a sign of prestige. Here, Swami Vishuddhananda, um, and this is the actual lens that took that photograph, which is now in Shampakur. Swami Vishuddhananda had stated that when Sri Ramakrishna saw this photograph, he went into ecstasy and touched it to his head several times, saying, Here, this photo is nicely taken. The mood is very high, fully merged in him. Here the Lord is depicted in his own nature. And when Holy Mother, um, there's an incident of Holy Mother being here uh, with the photograph, and I'm just going to read just the last line here. Ramakrishna came into the room and took bell leaves and flowers and worshipped his own photograph there. When you look at the photograph, what does this mean? To me, it means humility. Girish Ghosh was once asked, he asked, what is Ramakrishna's weapon? If Ram had the bow and the arrow, Krishna had his flute, Chaitanya had his begging bowl, what's Ramakrishna's weapon? His weapon was humility. He never contradicted anyone. Instead, he would embrace them. He would gently correct people by stating they were right, and he'd pull them into something greater. He doesn't contradict anybody's religion, but would say, you're right, but maybe it's more than what you think. He would correct people without embarrassing them, without hurting their ego. Previously in ancient India, um, you would defeat another person through logic. It would happen when Shankaracharya was there, he defeated Buddhism. And what would happen is if, you're, if somebody defeated your religion through these debates, then you would end up following their religion and their way of life. Sri Ramakrishna did not like this and didn't do it to anybody. He would show the truth of their own religion and broaden their understanding. Everybody he met, he would say, go further, go further. It's humility that endears everyone. Humility makes people come close to you. It eliminates fear and hesitation. You develop faith, trust, and friendship, and approachability. One of the Swamis told me, this photograph is swalabhya. Swalabhya means easy to approach. He's there at all times, anywhere, under any circumstances, and his love is unconditional. That's why Ramakrishna and Christ were known as the Patita Pavana, the purifier of the fallen. An avatar is one who comes down to our level. Avatar means descends, descends to our level, coming for our own needs, taking the forms of various gods and goddesses that is congenial with us to help walk with us on our unique path. And this photograph here shows 
a much more intimate relationship than the other two. No formalities are needed. When you see this photograph, how does it strike you? To me, it's someone that you see as a loving mother. Someone I don't have to project to. I don't have to have any pretenses. One condition Sri Ramakrishna wanted was, don't project, be who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done, come to me as is. I accept you as is. Someone who's a close friend. Someone who inspires us through their life, teachings, and actions. So, if photo number one represented the transcendental state of Brahman, and photo number two represents the personal aspect of the divine, Ishvara, photo number three, to me, represents the avatara state. And why this particular photograph may be worshipped in every house? Because when you sit with them, he appears to be present before you, ready to listen to you, to receive what you have to say, and then reflect back what you need. He may bless you by putting his hands on your head, or both hands if necessary. He may offer you his cloth as a way to dry up your tears. But as you move closer and have more private and intimate things to reveal, he's ready to take both hands and embrace you and pull you into him until maybe you merge in. Oprah Winfrey, I'm going to end off because this is the uh, city of Oprah Winfrey I've heard, had said, there, she had given, she said 20,000 interviews. She said there are four things that people wanted that she felt in, in, every, in every experience. Number one, did you hear me? Number two, did you see me? Number three, did what I say have any value to you? And number four, are you fully with me or are you distracted? Regarding the first one, did you hear me? As you pray to Sri Ramakrishna in this photograph, you begin to feel that there is someone who is listening, that your words are being received at the other end. Did you see me? Darshan is not only you seeing the Lord, you seeing the divine. It's also the experience of you recognize that the divine is seeing you. And as you start to look at that photograph more and more with love, with adoration, you start to feel a presence that is perceiving you, recognizing you, understanding you. Did what I say have any value to you? As you start to pray, what do you start to see happens? A sort of divine grace starts to shed upon you. Doors that, that begin to open, doors that weren't there begin to open. You start to notice that there's somebody, somebody who is being respons who's responding to me, who's listening to me, seeing me, and helping me in this journey. And number four, are you fully with me or are you distracted? When the divine awakens within you, you start to experience that divinity no matter what you're doing. Whether you're eating, sleeping, or playing, you feel that divine presence at all times, everywhere. That divine presence becomes your eternal companion. So today our prayer is that the divine, may he awaken, he or she awaken within our hearts and be our eternal companion. Thank you. So this is a, a really vast subject and um, what I have done is given you sort of my own interpretation. Sort of like a lawyer presenting different uh, clues and then building up a, what I have felt. And it's up to every one of us to find our own interpretation of what these means. And, and also, as you go along, you'll find that your interpretations may change. So don't get sort of like uh, sealed into one specific uh, sp uh, map. Uh, one Swami used to tell me, as you keep growing, 
that jigsaw puzzle you're seeing, it will keep changing. And the last thing, let me see. Um, one Swami told me, one way of connecting with the divine is chanting the mantra. But another way also is looking at the photos of the avatar. It creates, it creates a, uh, a vritti in your mind. And that vritti, that movement within the mind, is helping purify your mind just by looking at that. One Swami, Swami Shivananda said, just by looking at Ramakrishna is enough. <laughs> Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Bhunaktu Sahavir Yam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.